Hello, everyone. Uh, I am so thrilled to welcome you to today's panel, Data Sharing and Platform Urbanism, Contested Digital Sovereignty in the Emergent Smart City. Um, so just a, a quick overview. We're going to start with, um, with a convocation of sorts and introductions. Uh, then I'm going to give an overview and some highlights from the research that I uh, performed as a TAP Fellow this year. Um, and then we're going to get into it. Uh, I, I really consider my research an invitation to, to discussion and dialogue. And so modeling that idea, uh, we're going to start with a dialogue today that I hope all of you will join at the end with Q&A and, and onward after that. Uh, so who am I? My name is Stephen Larrick. I'm a resident fellow here with the Technology and Public Purpose Project here at Belfer. And I'll be your moderator and guide for today's conversation. Uh, and like I said, it's a conversation that I am so excited to have, um, both with our panel and with all of you. So for the past eight months, I've been researching a topic that, broadly speaking, has received much popular and academic attention, digital platforms and their impact on society and democracy. Uh, however, as an urban planner and a local government practitioner, I've been exploring this broad topic through a specific lens um, that might be different from the national conversation we've been having about Facebook misinformation and, and it say its impacts on our presidential elections. And that's the lens of the city where urban platforms that are often typified by this so-called sharing economy have had tangible impacts on how we move through, visit exp and experience urban space. Unlike on the national stage, here at the local level, city governments have not just talked about what to do about platforms, they've begun experimenting with new regulatory frameworks. Uh, and, and so whether you're an urbanist or not, I believe these experiments should be of interest. This subject of not just any platforms, but urban platforms is one that connects technology and planning to questions of governance, open knowledge, as well as to privacy and surveillance capitalism. Um, and all of this is really kind of wrapped up in ideas about the future of cities and who gets to decide that future. Today, we'll talk, tackle those topics with a particular focus on the role of data, its generation by users, its capture by platforms, and its use or not by government agencies. Um, and so in particular, we're gonna be looking at the role of a new regulatory framework through which cities are mandating urban platforms share data with them. Uh, and we couldn't have a better panel of experts to help us navigate these complex issues. So without further ado, let's, let's introduce them. Um, and I'm going to introduce them one at a time. They're each going to turn on their camera. And I'm going to have each of you answer just three simple questions. Who are you and, and what's your role in organization? How does your work and experience relate to today's theme? And what are you most excited to talk about? But let's do it kind of lightning style because we'll have time to get into it further later. So um, Ellen, let's start with you. Ellen P. Goodman is Associate Dean of Strategic Initiatives and Special Projects and a Professor of Law at Rutgers University. So Ellen. Hi everyone, um, thanks Stephen. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and admire so much um, and I've learned so much from the panelists. Uh, so I teach law at Rutgers Law School. Um, I study uh, smart cities and technology in cities as well as uh, information policy more generally. And I'm really excited to talk about power and how it flows through data in the city. Great. So next we have Dr. Sarah Barnes. Uh, Dr. Sarah Barnes, a respected researcher and urban digital strategist in the area of city data strategy, smart cities and digital storytelling. And um, Sarah wrote the book on this term platform urbanism that was influential in my research. So, so thrilled to have you, Sarah. What are you excited to talk about today? Thank you, Stephen. It's great to be joining you here today from Sydney. Um, look, I am just really excited to join this panel, particularly because I love um, anything to do with um, focusing on the ways that cities are actually playing a kind of leading role. Um, I like to think of it as a, a you know a more progressive and, and indeed um, radical role in terms of addressing some of these bigger issues around um, data sovereignty and surveillance capitalism. So. I'm really pleased to be joining you today. Thank you. Great. And last but not least, we have Rodney Stiles. Rodney Stiles is a government official, transport and labor pol policy consultant, uh, and he's the former head of policy for the mobility data management platform Populous, 
as well as the former Assistant Commissioner for Data and Technology at the City of, uh, of New York's Taxi and Limousine Commission, um, the agency that, uh, in fact, instituted some data sharing mandates on companies like Uber and Lyft. So Rodney, so thrilled to have you. Anything more to add on, on kind of how your experience relates to today's theme? And then what are you more, most excited to talk about today? Yeah, thanks. Uh, really excited to be here today. Also joining from Sydney, Australia. Uh, I have escaped the US. i have expat here for over a year now. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk about sort of the evolution of, of data sharing. Um, you know, we'll talk more about my role with the TLC, but it was a, 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 a different use case where, you know, there was a whole regulatory process and, and maybe a little bit different from some of the, the later data sharing that we've seen. So just excited to talk about how cities getting data really helps them come to the table to negotiate for good policy, um, which in the absence of that, there is this information asymmetry between the companies and the data they have and what the city knows about the services that run on their streets. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to get into it. Thanks for having me. Great, so um, there, there's our panel and um, uh, unfortunately you're stuck with me for the first part of this session. So uh, a little bit more about me. Um, my background is actually in urban planning. Um, I started out in, in a city hall reporting to a mayor um, and in open government advocacy, uh, where I worked at the Sunlight Foundation on issues of open government and open data, uh, both policy and practice. Um, and I've also worked uh, kind of on, on this issue, helping at, at a company that um, helped, helped uh, process uh, data for, for government uh, officials. Um, we've met our panelists. So I wanna start by just introducing the topic and some key concepts. So, um, Urban platforms arrived in cities uh, in, in kind of 2008 and 2009 is when, when Uber and Air, Airbnb first hit the scene. And they brought both benefits and risks. On the benefits side, we have new digital services um, and new consumer options. So new mobility choices, new options for where to stay, how to navigate the city, how to, how to receive information about the city. Um, and also new jobs and income options. Uh, and in a certain way, um, kind of new examples of, of how things could be different. And uh, that's kind of the kind way of putting regulatory disruption. Um, on, on the risks and harms to city side, we've also seen things like environmental impacts, stresses to infrastructure, market disruption, consumer protection issues, things like scams, uh, labor protection issues, things like people not being paid the, even the minimum wage um, or being classified as contractors, uh, issues around consumer privacy protections, uh, equity of how these services are deployed throughout the city, and then issues of, of kind of regulatory evasion and fairness in, in uh, various areas. And uh, in response to this, uh, I was interested in, in, a, in, in how cities were looking at the central role of data and in, in terms of thinking about uh, access to data as a tool in the toolbox. And so this is a, a graph that shows uh, data sharing policies enacted by cities um, from you know, relatively towards the beginning of the, the uh, arrival of the sharing economy towards uh, through, through 2021. And you can see that we've seen a real spike in, in this approach. Um, it, we'll get to it, but it, it kind of corresponds to the arrival of micromobility. Um, and so just given that this was happening, my thought was, what is this about? Let's understand it. It's clearly um, an ascendant regulatory framework. And uh, you know, I, sometimes the, the best way to contribute to a field is to do the boring thing. And so my real innovation was to read the policies. <laughs> um, I, 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 I gathered and aggregated about 70 different uh, data sharing mandates from uh, something like close to 50, uh, 45 or 50 different local government agencies. And to really try to understand these policies, I, I looked both at the history and theory of data sharing as well as that more empirical approach of you know, what do the policies themselves say. Uh, my outputs uh, at the end of this academic year have been a policy database that have all these policies that made them more accessible to the, the, the field, um, set of maps and visualization around those, those policies uh, and their metadata, um, some qualitative accounting of the history and origins of, of data sharing mandates, um, as well as some best practice policy guidance for city officials uh, and finding and recommendations for the field. And I've put all of these together 
on a, a hub that I call the Platform Urbanism Data Sharing Policy Hub. And I'll share that link in the chat uh, towards the end of our session. So I want to start with the origins uh, part here, the history and theory part, and give a quick accounting of how I saw this practice developing um, from that kind of early, early days through the present. And so this is a story that really starts with the arrival of uh, big data and the mobile phone um, around 2007 is kind of the rough estimate of what I'm, I'm putting here. And we see the private sector surpassing the public sector uh, in terms of its access to information about the city and its processing of data capabilities. And around kind of in response to that, we see uh, organizations globally including at, at the UN Global Pulse initiative, um, this kind of call for data philanthropy, for uh, these new data that are being collected in the private sector to be put to public good, to public use, um, through almost what's described as corporate charity, uh, kind of making this data available. And we see things like the Yelp dataset challenge, like Waze uh, Connected Citizens Program, or like the Strava Global Heat Map and the Strava Metro Program emerge. And then we kind of get to the realm of cities interacting specifically with sharing economy platforms. And this notion of data philanthropy clearly had an impact on how on expectations and on negotiations between cities and platforms. And we see a model where predominantly, if we go back to our, uh, our, our chart from earlier, this is kind of this phase here, where we're only seeing a couple of, of data sharing mandates a year, predominantly, platforms are sharing data through kind of voluntary uh, approaches where they're really setting the terms. And it's only more recently that we've seen this explosion of the mandate as kind of this new model. And so in addition to kind of looking at this through that history lens, I also uh, looked at the policies themselves. And so here's just some examples of, um, after pulling together 70 of these data sharing mandates, I can see, for instance, that the majority of them are passed by departments of transportation. Um, and then kind of the second uh, largest agency responsible for these mandates are, are councils and legislatures. You can break them down by uh, the type of platform, whether that's micromobility, ride hail, uh, short-term rental or other platforms. And then we can also analyze the text uh, of these policies. And so these are the policies that contain the word privacy or that mention privacy. So just this is just a quick snapshot of the types of analysis that I did on this data set once compiled. Again, I put this all together into the Platform Urbanism Data Sharing Policy Hub that contains uh, a repository that anyone can download uh, with access to the, to the links, um, as well as the text itself uh, in a searchable format. Um, you can view these geospatially, um, and you can view various dashboards uh, that, that kind of provide some of this analysis as well. Um, additionally, I put together some best practices around this concept of how can we have, um, if these programs are going to exist, what are, what are the sorts of responsible practices that need to be put in place uh, to make sure that say privacy is taken into account and that these are done in a way that is transparent and accountable to the people. Uh, because this isn't really just a binary between a platform and a government agency, we also have to make sure that these are all accountable to uh, the public and to communities themselves. And so uh, by putting together best practices and also connecting that to policy language, I'm hopeful that this can at least be a starting point for um, helping these experiments learn from each other and get better and helping them do, do so in the public in ways that uh, we as a field can have a conversation about. So just some quick takeaways, both practical and, uh, and big picture political. I believe that these are the types of experiments that we can learn from meaningfully and that uh, we need to kind of provide cities guidance on how to do this responsibly so that these experiments can continue. Um, I believe that uh, access to best practices and iteration is key. Uh, that there's a need for understanding what specific data is being asked for and mm -hmm. why and making sure that that kind of this isn't a one size fits all approach, but that certain principles of data minimization or of, of kind of cost benefit are taken into consideration. Um, that we've developed clear frameworks for what sorts of platforms are fair uh, and, and what sorts of platform data are, are fair game for this approach um, and why. Um, 
And then we, we've also kind of uh, this other area for, I think, further study is around state preemption, as well as the need for national um, protections uh, for things like consumer privacy uh, around this issue. And then more on the big picture and, and some of the things that we'll also talk about on the big picture scale. Um, again, there's a debate that has, has arisen around these policies. And I think sometimes we can see that debate devolve into a false binary um, that really needs to be thought of as not as, as an e as not an either or, but we can have both privacy and democratic accountability. And how do we ask that question of how might we get there? Um, and what's the vision we're aligning around? And so, um, you know, I think on the one hand, we have the need to prevent harms from platforms and, and to kind of think about how cities can um, play a role in, in, in enforcing both digital rights as well as community interests. On the other hand, there's kind of this big picture vision of, um, of sort of what is public, what is public infrastructure, and, and how do we build a, a, a public knowledge commons. Um, and I think these are larger kind of questions that we need to talk about more openly and not just to get distracted by the narrow topic of, uh, of kind of data sharing. So um, I think that's, that's kind of a broad overview. And now we're gonna, we're gonna take a step back and, um, and talk about it because I really don't think these are clear answers. There's something that, that, that again, demands conversation. So I'm gonna figure out how to stop sharing my screen here. There we go. So my first question to the panel, um, uh, the way that I would like to structure this conversation is by starting really with the descriptive and then moving to the normative and then to the big picture. And so I wanna start with just, you know, each of you bring a different lens to this uh, as practitioners, as academics, as uh, legal minds. And so, you know, what do we really see as happening here? And how do you, you know, wh how, how do you think about this story? What's going on? What are the impacts for cities? What are the implications? And Rodney, I don't. Maybe we can start with you uh, as someone who can maybe bring up some practical uh, insight and examples to this. Yeah, yeah. I think sort of from my experience uh, at the Taxi and Limousine Commission, starting in in 2012 when I joined the agency. That's right when when Uber around when Uber had come into New York City. So kind of grew up in that agency along with uh, Uber. And, you know, I think, and I, I mentioned Uber specifically because I think that in many ways they drive a lot of what's happened here. Uh, coming in to many cities with this move fast and break things uh, mantra, which at, at the best meant operating in a regulatory gray area and at the worst meant like purposefully like skirting the wall and just doing whatever they wanted. I think that really pissed cities off. So I think that was kind of an inciting incident. Um, but along with that uh, sort of attitude came, you know, just this massive amount of data that the company had, um, promises that they were gonna use that data to really understand what was happening in cities, change all of logistics and transport, which they have yet to do. Um, and on the other side of that, cities were, you know, being asked to either get rid of them completely, regulate them in different ways, and just were, had a lack of information. So they're coming to the table without, you know, an ability to actually know what's going on in their own city. Uh, you know, with companies, it wasn't just Uber, Lyft also joined in, right? Um, who have an, an amazing amount of information about their cities. So I, I think that's really the inciting sort of incident. And when scooters came in, you had companies like Bird, where the head of it, Travis, was a former Uber employee. And he's like, I know this playbook, we'll use the same one. And cities were like, wait, hold on, fool me once. <laughs> uh, and I think that's when you started to see cities really taking the reins. And especially with, you know, e-scooters, um, you know, there wasn't this play made yet um, where folks like Uber and Lyft went to states to sort of preempt cities from being able to even collect that information. So that's where you kind of see that shift. Um, that's the early days. I'd see where we're shifting now is sort of, what does this look like from an operational perspective? Now you have the data, how are you using that data? And I think that's something that cities have figured out um, since beginning to get it. At first, it's like, okay, great. We have all this data. What do we do with it? Um, to finally understanding like, okay, we're gonna use this data to feed into our equity goals to make sure that 
you know, we're providing service across the city uh, to communities that have traditionally been disadvantaged from a transport stand standpoint. Uh, so I think we have seen sort of from this, like maybe a little reactionary to something that is more of a business as usual use case for, for getting that data and using it. Yeah, and I think let's let's um let's let's kind of pin that idea of some of the exam examples you had from TLC, um, but let's let's kind of get an accounting of just what's going on. How do you see this from the, kind of your perspective and your work um, from from our other panels as well? Um, so, Ellen or Sarah, do you have thoughts of kind of just these trends uh, around the arrival of platforms, the development of voluntary data sharing, and then the emergence of the mandate as kind of a new uh, a, a, a kind of response to that? Well, I, I'll, um, I mean, I can share sort of my perspective on this as, as a legal scholar um, is that, you know, I'm sort of seeing this movement in the context of power relationships um, and sort of, uh, you know, legal authority. And so actually at the um, Harvard Law School, Jerry Frug, who's the, who's the sort of um, most renowned scholar of local government and was, was my teacher. I mean, he, what he taught was that, you know, over time cities have lost more and more power um, to the states. And so I think, uh, I think that's true, you know, around the world um, as well. And so I think, you know, this moment that Rodney's talking about when Uber comes in is this sort of pivotal moment when first of all, cities want to do something about it. And at the same time, they don't have much power. They used to have data, um, but now the private sector has more data and knows more about what's going on in their rights of way and in their cities than they do. Um, all their power derives from the states. And so you have this movement of power from public to private. Um, also, companies that are doing sort of sandboxing in, in cities and they're trying out their tech and the value of that tech is going to be global. So there's this kind of expropriative movement um, uh, where you, you've got um, industries essentially using uh, data, which comes to be viewed as this critical raw material um, in, in sort of the, the um, uh, expansion and the, the explosion of their businesses worldwide. And so at this moment, you know, what Rodney liked, uh, you know, 10 years ago, let's say um, a decade ago, cities start looking at this and there's this moment of sort of panic and flex, right? Like we need to assert power. We need to start viewing data as a resource. And maybe that means having not just requiring data sharing with the city, but also having revenue shares with these businesses that are going to um, be built on the backs of, of, a, of a sandbox local experiment. Um, and so I guess to sum up, what I would say is that, um, you know, I sort of view it as cities trying to use what power they have um, and to grab what value they can in a structure in which they are losing power and losing access to value. Yeah. I think that uh, I think that kind of effectively names some of the trends we're seeing there, um, and I think uh, one of the things we'll want to pin and, and come back to again is that idea of power. Um, I, I think this kind of concept of information and its relation to power is also something we should re-examine. Um, there's maybe more to it, as you mentioned, with the idea of revenue sharing, and maybe there's more to it than the data. Um, so, Sarah, from your perspective. I'm curious, as someone who, at least for me, kind of reified this term of platform urbanism, what was it that you were seeing in terms of the emergence of platforms as an intermediary for how we, how we experience urban space? And can you speak at all to the centrality of data and how that came to be? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I started to be interested in the, the kind of concept of the platform as a sort of infrastructure of urban exchange. Um, yeah, I guess it would be around 2012 or so at the time that um, we're talking about these, this emergence of urban platforms, but obviously building also on significant social media platforms as well. And just understanding the kind of effectiveness of a platform architecture for instrumenting and um, building ecosystems of exchange. And I think that was the kind of key Kind of turning point for me when I started to analyze um, platforms and started to think in terms of platform urbanism, we we came out of this era when it was all about it was a there was a sense of openness 
um, the emergence of big data was um, accompanied by the sense of abundance that everything that we were doing was generating all of this data and it was all available for use um, in new ways for new kinds of intelligence. I mean, I spent a lot of time, my PhD was actually on real-time cities. So this idea that there was just like new capacities for intelligence everywhere. And what became increasingly clear to me um, was that in fact, that, that forms of intelligence were very much bundled around particular information architectures. Um, and increasingly those information architectures were of, in, a, in a sense, like the walled gardens of the early 2000s web environment, um, except that they facilitated such effective um, infrastructures for exchange. And I know we're focusing very much on transport platforms here, but essentially, you know, we, we, we all know that the, the, the information architecture of platforms is, is effective in any kind of form of interaction that we're engaged in today. And so I think it, that's been the real shift for me to understand that um, as we've been talking about, in order for governance to be effective in this environment, governments need to actually absorb the lessons of platform architectures and look at ways that they can then um, build on those, replicate those, or, or indeed redesign those in ways that can actually facilitate more of a kind of public good um, environment. And that is a real challenge. I mean, that's the challenge that we're talking about today is how do we actually reimagine um, what good governance is um, in an era in an era of platform urbanism and platform governance, I don't think we have the full answers to those, but that's where we've arrived. Interesting, yeah, and I, I think this I, that kind of larger concept of um, the information ecosystem and where we've arrived to, I think, is such a critical lens for this. Um, and and I think so. Taking it from there, from that kind of broader landscape of the information and, uh, ecosystem. Maybe Rodney, I think as we we think about what's happening, it could be great to start with an example. And I know that you arrived uh, at TLC, and it was shortly thereafter that um, in 2014 there was kind of a change to how TLC was uh, interacting with RideHail and thinking about data collection. So I'm I'm curious if you could talk us through either that story or uh, another example from 2016. But maybe just give us um, sure. the play-by-play -play of of how did this come to be? What was the need that uh, the public agency saw? Why, why was there a perceived need to collect data? What was that process like of putting, of setting up a mandate? And then what was the impact? Yeah, yeah. And I guess I'll just start with some background. So the situation in New York, I think was a little bit different in that Uber from its beginning in, in New York was, was always regulated by the city. Um, in most other cities in, in the US at least, um, they are regulated at the state level. Um, this is because those companies actually went to the states and asked to be regulated at the state level so that cities couldn't regulate them. Um, but because you know, sort of Uber's earliest business model was just a, a luxury limousine that you could order on an app and they, New York was their city number two, um, you know, they were fully regulated by the taxi commission already. Um, so that meant that there were already rules and regulations that they had to follow, um, one of which was a data retention policy. So any community car service limo company um, at that time, there was already an existing rule that they had to retain certain records for trips that they were performing. Um, this was not a data reporting rule, but what we did in 2014 was make it one. Um, and the reason why we decided to do that is we were already collecting data from, from taxis um, from 2008. Um, and, and we really saw how that impacted our ability to make policy that was actually informed. Um, you know, prior to that, I would say policy was made by the loudest person in the room. I think that's why there's been a lot of lobbying money that had traditionally come from the taxi industry in New York. Uh, so we saw, you know, what we could really do in terms of policy making and we knew that uh, things were changing and we didn't want to be reactionary. We wanted to be proactive. So we took that first step in 2014. And because we just took a rule that said, you must keep these records and turned it into a rule that says you must report them. It was sort of this way to, to do it more incrementally where we thought you know, our chances for success of passing that rule would be higher because it was really a, a version of an existing rule. Um, you know, Uber, at first didn't want to do it. They refused to 
um, you know, submit some sample data when we had basically subpoenaed them to do so. Um, we ended up actually shutting them down for a day, which really changed their minds about uh, whether they wanted to comply or not. Um, and, you know, that rule was passed in 2014. I think what was interesting was at the time, you know, the argument really was Uber, you're, you're just like this small car service company that maybe has 10 cars. Um, you're the same, you just operate with an app. So we actually asked for that data from all of those companies and there were a thousand of them. And so you're talking about dealing with implementing something from a technological standpoint where you have Uber on one side who, you know, can, has heaps of data, they can generate the reports you're asking for versus, you know, a company that we literally had to show how to use Excel so that they could submit data to the taxi commission, uh, which was quite an interesting sort of journey that we, we went on. So I think, um, I think it's really helpful to understand uh, what this looks like. Can you, can you, just to, to kind of um, flesh out the story just a little bit more, could you speak a little bit to how this was received politically? Was this controversial? How did, and, and kind of what was the mechanism? Uh, my understanding is this was a, a TLC rule. Yeah, so the, the, the Taxi Commission is an actual commission board. Um, so any changes in rules would go before that board. So we really had to make the public case for why, and any rule changes would include, um, you know, a, a, a basically a covering brief that would say, you know, we're asking for this this data. It will be used in this way for policy making, for understanding, you know, how how trends are changing, uh, what drivers are working for multiple companies, which is something we knew was starting to happen. Um, and so it had to have a public hearing um, where actually Uber showed up and said, hey, we, we think that this, you know, uh, violates our sort of ability, our trade secrets, um, uh, which, you know, legally it, so far <laughs> has been found to not do that. Um, I would say in that first round, the public, there wasn't a, a, a big public uh, reaction to, to getting that data. Again, because I think we took this incrementalist approach of starting with something that was already being collected and, and, and started receiving it. Right. And maybe we can talk later about uh, 2016 and, and sort of the different reaction that you received then. Um, but I do want to um, uh, kind of check back in with our other panelists about sort of this idea of um, justification and, and the politics of this as well as um, kind of getting a little bit into that normative side of things, um, you know, there, there are implications uh, for, uh, you know, why should a city be allowed to collect data? Um, and so, you know, in Rodney's case, it sounds like there was a hearing, they had a specific existing regulatory framework that they were able to point to to say, this is why we're interested in this data. But we've seen a, a broad range of different types of justifications, typically around um, enforcement, evaluation, planning, and policy. And I'm, I'm curious, maybe Ellen, if you'd, if you'd want to start us off thinking about how, you know, what, what, what's, what should we be thinking about in terms of what's in, what's in play, what's, what's in bounds versus out of bounds. Um, clearly there are certain types of platforms we would never want a government, um, to grab data from a, a dating platform, something like this, that might be you know, relevant to the public, to, to, to kind of certain public questions. But um, clearly we have, we have some sort of intuitive idea of what is public, what is private, and when, it, when a government should be able to ask for information or not. Um, is there anything you can do to kind of frame that for us uh, from, from either a legal background or, or your smart cities work? Yeah, so, so you mentioned um, the need for data for evaluation for law enforcement. I think there's another one, which is this notion that of reciprocity, that when a company is using the rights of way, um, that the city deserves some value back for that. Um, and so that's, again, looking at data as as value. And so, you know, an instance, an instance of that that people may be familiar with, that's not about data, is if you think about a cable franchise. Um, those, you know, those are deals, those are just contracts, and the cable company gets to provide service. And, you know, in return, 
um, it's supposed to provide something for the city that that it wouldn't the market wouldn't otherwise support. So maybe it has public access channels, um, or maybe it agrees to put cable where it's not commercially viable. Sort of you know Rodney's point about equity and not having digital redlining. Um, and so you know so that's another justification. And I think you know you're absolutely right. So if we think about um, where is it legitimate for the city to kind of make this either make this deal um, if we frame it that way or simply as a regulatory requirement. And I think the core of where that's permissible is when it, it's about the right of way. It's about managing its right, of, its right of way or very close to that, an area that's highly regulated. So something like, you know, I know you, that your database, you know, it's, it's mobility and it's sort of Airbnb or, or rental, short-term rentals, right? Because those are, you know, highly regulated. As you get further out, now, of course, the city regulates lots of things, like it regulates, you know, liquor licenses and restaurants. And um, do we think it's valid? Should the city be able to say, as a condition of operating a restaurant in our city, we need all the data of, you know, every 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 order and every everyone who walks, walks down at a table? You know, I think we'd be uncomfortable with that. And so there's this notion of this nexus, right, that we're looking for between you know, what data has been collected and why the city needs it, enforcement and, and sort of um, evaluation, you know, I think you definitely want to make sure that those are in play. As we get further away from those things and as the business becomes less and less about the city right of way or something that's highly regulated, um, it looks more and more like a land grab, right? Like it's just a data grab and also the as the city's need for that data goes down, then the privacy concerns and the concerns about leakage, um, either explicit sharing or leakage of that data to other parts of, um, of the city where we might not want to go and become higher. So that's how I would frame it. I think uh, all, all really fascinating examples. And um, I think we'll, we'll kind of come back to this uh, question of privacy and some of more specific um, kind of concerns and and issues and potential risk risk uh, points on, on that issue, as well as potentially Rodney, as I mentioned, the example in New York. Um, one other thing I want to mention from what you said, Ellen, uh, the restaurant example is fascinating. And just one real example I came across in the research um, is that of uh, uh, food delivery companies, urban, de urban food delivery companies um, and, and a proposed legislation in New York that would have them require them to share data, not with the city, but with the restaurants they're serving. And um, I think it speaks to this idea of data as um, kind of this uh, perceived uh, proxy for power or, or something that has power in it. Um, and and the, the, the role the city is trying to play in pr protecting its, um, its constituents in a certain way by saying, hey, these global platforms are not going to just purely extract the data from the restaurants without sharing it back with them. And Sarah, I know you've done some writing around um, you know, data as, as kind of this medium of negotiation and of power. I'm curious uh, just what you've thought of, of both uh, what Rodney and Ellen have shared as well as about kind of this, this idea of the role of data again. Yeah, I mean, I actually began my career uh, in the media policy landscape in the early 2000s. Um, and in Australia, we, we have a kind of a system whereby um, policy regulation of the um, radio communication spectrum and broadcasting spectrum is one in which um, commercial licenses or licensees um, are, are able to access highly um, valuable um, um, areas of the public spectrum. Um, but they, in, in our regulatory landscape, um, as, it, as it was, uh, those commercial licensees, so commercial television stations, for example, were required through particular standards to essentially reinvest um, back into um, a local um, production economy and production sector. Um, in order to ensure that there was a kind of public benefit outcome from their being able to access this, this valuable spectrum. Um, that's a kind of fundamental kind of framework for public broadcasting policy. And through that lens, I mean, I, I see it applying to, to the city environment because essentially um, urban platforms are, um, are able to monetize access to highly valuable urban data. 
um, by by virtue of being able to operate, by virtue of being able to um, operate under under a license. Um, and, and it's interesting to kind of use that lens of spectrum in a way to say, well, what what if we actually did say, well, in in exchange for being able to be operate in this landscape where you can access the the, the, the valuable data because we're working in very dense uh, landscapes of urban exchange when we're in cities. So being able to operate there. There are certain obligations of you to share that data for other areas where we where we may be lacking. So I find that kind of a, a useful conceptual frame, and we also know well there's precedent for this kind of um, you know framework as well. Um, I think that the the instances of of actually you know say, saying what is um, valid for for data sharing, where do we cross the line? You know what is the nexus between um, what can be shared and what can't be, particularly questions around privacy. I mean, I think we we do need to be looking at some of the emerging tools here, um, you know, around around kind of private by privacy by design, um, encrypted platforms. Um, you know, the, the decode example in in Barcelona was a really good one to say, well, that's you know an experiment in how citizens, um, in the way that they're navigating urban apps, the range of urban apps that we will be using, um, can actually also elect to say, I'm happy to share my data in these ways, uh, I'm happy to share on, on these occasions, and to actually create that kind of um, decision point for citizens. Um, and, that, and that's been an interesting kind of experiment to date in navigating that as well, which I thought I would raise. Uh, how successful they are, is you know is a question. Um, I think it requires a lot for citizens to be so actively engaged in their their own sort of data economies, if you like. Um, but I certainly think we need to be experimenting um, that in ways that address this this nexus question. Absolutely. And so I think let's let's stay on that topic of of kind of finding that balance. On the one hand, I think um, I think one of the things that intrigued me about this regulatory framework and the debate surrounding it is that you can really see the validity of both sides of this, this argument, I think, when it comes to privacy. On the one hand, um, you have a, a company, a platform, a private platform, um, you know, through which private users are interacting and, and submitting their private data. And so by what right does a city have to kind of mandate and take that private information? On the other hand, uh, it's quite common in, in a, a number of, of, of kind of components of the ways in which uh, cities regulate business to, for there to be some sort of reporting or regulatory uh, you know, requirement for information sharing, whether that's, um, you know, you need to share certain information to get a business license or you have to you know, share quarterly numbers on a thing. Um, one of the things that really supercharged this debate was the arrival of e-scooters and, um, the city of Los Angeles putting forth a vision around, uh, you mentioned the real-time city, um, around quite frequent information sharing at a quite granular level. And um, I think maybe before we get to that, Rodney, I, I'd be curious if you could share a, a kind of precursor to, I think, that debate, which is what kind of your experience was in 2016 around gathering some of the, inf the kind of pickup drop-off location data uh, for for Uber trips and some of the pushback you got on from the privacy community on that. Yeah, sure. As I mentioned earlier, 2014 there wasn't a lot of of pushback, but perhaps not only was that because there was this incrementalism, but also the information was um, a little bit more limited. So it was just uh, you know pickup location and and driver ID and and um, vehicle ID and date and time. Uh, in 2016, when you know, we drafted rules to expand that to include drop-off uh, date, times, and locations, when you have that pair, uh, you can certainly start to figure out a little bit more from that data, obviously, um, than just looking at pickups. Um, and so you know, I, you know, this was all coming out of uh, driver fatigue rules that um, you know, we had put together to limit driver hours behind the wheel. There were a couple of, um, you know, pretty uh, noted incidents where drivers were working 16, 18 hours behind the wheel, um, you know, some of which ended, uh, you know, quite 
sadly, um, with someone you know dying. So we were quite serious about getting this rule on the books. Um, and the first version of the rule, people weren't happy about it. We were trying to use the data we had to, to make it work. Um, and it was actually the companies who suggested we expand our data collection mm. to craft a better rule. That's um, fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> However, when we didn't do it the way that they thought we should uh, is when they kind of mounted a public campaign against us, uh, started a hashtag TLC don't track me, um, which, you know, trying to push that out in a kind of astroturfy way um, kind of backfired on Uber because early 2017, there were a number of PR fiascos going on. Um, that the hashtag kind of morphed into Uber don't track me um, because of some questionable privacy related uh, policies on Uber's end, at least in the early days, I think they're certainly better now. Um, so it was a different uh, sort of pushback there. Um, and I think legitimate privacy concerns. And I think the way that we handled them was bringing in you know, a group of, of lawyers, practitioners, privacy experts to think about what's the level of data we absolutely need to make this policy, enforce this policy, um, but also under open data rules, you know, how are we going to obscure this data, aggregate this data to protect privacy? Um, understanding that, yeah, if you, if you provide the latitude and longitude of a pickup and drop off, you can really start to figure out patterns of travel. Um, and, and, and I guess something I'll note here is that this data is interesting because it, it do, doesn't just reveal data about the travel patterns of passengers, but also drivers. So it's kind of two parties data at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. So even getting consent of one doesn't necessarily you know, give you that consent of the other. So the drivers being you know, licensed and regulated by the TLC, there is a little bit of a higher standard that they have to meet. So that's sort of how we justify getting the data to understand their hours behind the wheel. But in terms of the passenger side, anything that we would release, um, you know, in a public records request through our open data, which we proactively put out there, um, you know, we aggregated so that instead of that exact location, you're talking about census tracts and, um, you know, just fully removing some of the fields that were in the data that we had, because we thought that they would make it a lot easier to either on their own identify specific patterns or people or in combination with other publicly available data sets, the same thing. Right. So, I mean, I think one of the things we hear there is that by its very nature, uh, these platforms are collecting pretty sensitive information in some cases. And in the case of a lot of these platforms, if there's a two-sided marketplace, it can be drivers and riders. Um, and then we also had kind of that, you know, that interesting dynamic where they were asking you to change the rule. Hey, you can use more of our data to do that. But then when they didn't like the rule, there was kind of a, a, a different sort of conversation. Um, and we also see in that example, the use of uh, kind of platforms as a conduit for um, political expression as well, right? Like um, the use of a hashtag. I know they also sent out an email to users um, encouraging their users to use this hashtag. And so, yeah, I mean, I think to what extent does this point to um, issues of, uh, of privacy and privacy best practice, but also of control? Eleanor, Sarah, do you have uh, comments on that, on Rodney's example or of kind of the broader field? Um, well, I, you know, I think, and you mentioned LA, um, maybe I can, I can pick up the story there and, and sort of comment on, on some of your questions. And so I think Los Angeles was watching the experience in New York and, and also looking ahead to air taxis and sort of like a more intensive um, uh, sort of mobility um, uh, environment and decided that instead of going or either demanding data or asking for data or negotiating for data, um, they would just do sort of data acquisition by design. And so they built, um, you know, or, or co-built um, a something called a mobility data specification, um, which is an open standard 
ideally now, I don't know, I think like 150 or so um, cities use it. So it's a way to, to standardize um, the data that's coming from, mostly it's used for micro mobility companies, Lime, et cetera. Um, so that that data goes directly to the city through an open um, API. And then the city in return, it's two ways can issue, um, they can take that data to do the things even that you suggested evaluation, but they can also do it um, to use it for law enforcement. So they can send back uh, through the API instructions, um, you know, about don't leave the scooter there, this road's going to be closed, um, et cetera. And so I think, um, I, you know, you had asked about the power dynamics. Um, and I think that is an assertion of sort of public power sometimes called digital sovereignty. Um, you know, we're not gonna ask for the data. We're just gonna, it's gonna run through us. It's gonna be visible to us. Um, and I think though that the mistake they made there, and so that was real time data is that they did not have a justification, I don't believe for why they needed it to be real time data, why they needed it so great. It's like, it's like you know, many um, times more granular than just longitude and latitude of, of, of pickups, I think, because it's it's constant, um, real time. And and so they were sort of stepped into a huge controversy with lawsuits and then ultimately the state um, taking away some of this power that they had um, because states can always do that. And so, you know, again, let's sort of nested set of power um, structures, but, you know, even though I think it was a faulty, there were sort of some sort of missing justifications. Um, I think it was a very interesting sort of punch back against um, the power that micromobility companies, how much power do they have? But I think actually it was signaling to the power of the, of the air taxis um, uh, that they might have when they come into the city. Yeah, interesting. And so I think um, I want to open this up uh, to some of our questions coming in from the Q&A as well. Um, and I, one thing we heard in that answer, we had a question earlier about just like literally what, how is the data being received? And is this an Excel spreadsheet? And one of the things that I saw is that in the, in the policies, at least in some of my conversations with uh, kind of the public officials involved in, these, involved in these various data sharing programs, is there, there has been a variety of different ways of collecting data um, and it does vary by sector. And one of the best practice recommendations that came out of my research was really your, the format of data requested and the, the fields and the frequencies should really be right fit to the regulatory need. And so, um, you know, if, if this is a case of understanding um, some macro level compliance issues and regularly making sure that um, short-term rentals are, are you know, that they're uh, in, in the zones of the city where they're supposed to be, um, maybe you don't need that uh, as frequently as um, hourly, but you can accept that quarterly uh, or whatever it happens to be. And maybe you don't need that via an API, you can receive that via a CSV. And so that was the type of thing we did see. Um, I know that um, Rodney, you, you all were receiving data that was kind of being submitted via FTP uh, dump. And uh, for a lot of these, uh, the, the mobility data specification that Ellen just mentioned with e-scooter companies, this is via an API. So this is a way for a city's uh, system, software system to speak directly to the platform system um, in, in ways that kind of can change the game in certain ways. Um, so yeah, happy to follow up on that. But we also have a question from uh, Nabil. And it, it, I think it, it strikes at something that, that I also came across in this research, which is, uh, Nabil asks, what intellectual property arrangements can cities put in place to ensure that the value of IP, including but not limited to data, generated through private smart city digital infrastructure initiatives can be returned to the city? Or how do we address the perverse incentive that can create uh, uh, in terms of the city collecting data, it shouldn't for the value of that data. Um, and so, I, you know, one of the things that that calls to mind for me is sort of this surveillance capitalist um, uh, uh, dilemma that cities find themselves in. And I think I can share my screen again. Um, you know, one, one common sentiment I heard uh, was sort of this idea of, let me present this here. 
of we don't really have a good option. Our, our, our economy now has changed in this big way. And you know, our, our public institutions might recognize that surveillance capitalism is creepy or, or it has some, some things that they're not necessarily sure that they agree with. Um, and they kind of feel stuck. Well, either we can say we're not going to participate in this data economy, um, but feel as though the ri that risks this idea of further information asymmetry and erosion of, of local government power as that asymmetry increases. Or, hey, let's, let's join in too. Um, but then we kind of have this risk of, of kind of what Nabil was getting at, how to, you know, of, of the creep of let's, let's go after ever more and more data. And so kind of what, is there a third way? Is there another model? Um, it was sort of a central question of this research. Um, and it was something that I really saw cities both struggling with, but I did see that as, as one of the, um, the goals of a lot of these programs. So um, I do think the key for finding that third way is putting restrictions in place that would prevent something like that creep. Um, and if you go, do go to the policy hub, you can, you can see some examples of some of the restrictions that cities are putting in place. And I think you can also see some gaps and, and rooms for improvement. And, and, and that's the conversation we need to be having. Um, so we also have I, another question. I just, for, yeah. I just want to say something about it, Nabil. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I think um, I, I'd be curious, even if you could say a little bit more about the restrictions um, cities are placing on the revenue share, I mean, what I've seen is, you know, companies do not give away, do, are not really willing to share their IP um, with cities. And and so cities have not succeeded. I know there have been a few examples, I think with Palantir in New York, where um, there were some revenue shares, I agree, it creates perverse incentives. But my sense was that even if cities really want to do that, they're not going to be able um, to get much of, you know, they're really not going to be able to get equity stakes in private IP. That is actually not something that I, revenue share was not something that I really dug into. And certainly I didn't see IP sharing. I saw IP as a, as a justification for not wanting to share data. Um, but yeah, I don't know if either of the other panelists have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, something that I've been reflecting on as we've been we've been discussing this topic is that you know it's important to remember that many of the um, platform ecosystems that we're talking about are actually built on you know fundamental um, forms of open data and government investment in um, data and information infrastructure. The, the most basic example would be GPS, for example, um, and that and that. There were decisions, deliberate decisions made to actually make those open platforms for wider public use. Um, so I, I mean, the work of Mariana Mazzucato, I think, is really important here in reframing the possibilities around public value, whereby um, public investment is actually seen as a as an active contributor to the value um, generated through through private sector companies. So with that lens, um, there's a question of how can data sharing arrangements be kind of right fit, if you like to use that phrase, to support um, that the shared value that is generated out of that um, arrangement. So I think, yeah, just returning to the fact that we, I think traditionally government has seen its role as creating the open infrastructure in many instances from which innovation can flourish. But we're now in this kind of almost correction phase where the questions of value need to be rethought. Right. And so I know we're bumping up against the hour here. There's so much to talk about. Like I said, I'd like to view this as the beginning of a conversation. I think in line with um, some of what we were just discussing, I I'd love to end on sort of this topic of, is this, is this about something more than data? What is a platform? What is the role of a platform in the city? And uh, you know, is, uh, is a platform something that we see as, um, something that should be run by the government? Is it something that we see as a utility? Is it something that we do think the private sector should be running? Um, and to what extent are some of these concerns something that a city is doing by necessity because we haven't seen the types of consumer protections or privacy protections that we needed to see um, at the state or national level? Um, I would love to kind of maybe just do a quick round from all of you to share maybe your thoughts on that and then any final thoughts on this topic before we wrap. Sarah, let's start with you. I guess 
Um, it's not an area that I know. I'm, I'm, I, it's an emerging interest of mine, um, the field of, kind of um, smart regulation, smart contracts, and, and forms of data sharing that are not actually about um, accessing the raw data, but you know, being able to access the, um, the meaning of that, of that data. And I think these kinds of, uh, yeah, a kind of um, algorithmic forms of, of data sharing are gonna become more and more important. And I think will help to address um, or at least help to raise the questions around um, what data is appropriate to being shared um, and how to right fit um, data sharing with the regulatory um, needs that it's trying to address without overstepping the mark. So I think that's, that's a field that I'm, I'm quite interested in as a one that responds to many of the um, critical questions that we've been discussing today. Great. Um, Ellen, any, any kind of final comments on the broader um, questions beyond data or just reflections on the conversation? Um, you know, Uber should be should be um, taken should be made uh, 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 into a public utility. However, to the extent that you know the Ubers of the world end up taking over sort of transit um, and sort of quintessentially public functions, then they have to be sort of regulated probably as a public utility. Um, but um, I, I also think it's worth thinking, and I think we're headed there, where data and AI, you know, almost become, um, whether it's in the form of a data trust or some other kind of data bank, become kind of essential infrastructure. And so in that sense, they become kind of a utility where private companies should be able to access them, but also cooperatives and other forms of, of um, nonprofits uh, should be able to access that sort of fundamental um, utility. And Rodney, uh, would love to hear from you uh, uh, from the, the vantage point of a practitioner. You know, what, what, what do you think this conversation touches on beyond data and any reflections on the conversation? Yeah, I think a, a big role of cities, especially in the transportation sector is this sort of setting rules for how everybody plays nicely with each other. So across different modes and different companies and different actors like the companies and, and drivers and vehicle owners. So, you know, there could be a role, you know, a, a, a platform would just be sort of the digital version of that. Um, so you certainly see with cities looking toward things like mobility as a service, trying to start to think about what that might look like. I think what's most, what might be most effective is, is cities and, and other governments setting rules around the kinds of data that those companies share with each other that can feed into these platforms, whether they be for consumers or for regulation purposes. Um, and then, so that's one side. And then I guess back to this public utility question. Yeah, I'd love to see profitability for many of these transport companies. Traditionally, transportation has not been a profitable business. And we've seen a long history of private companies that then become public when they become unprofitable and unsustainable. Uh, so I also just wonder what the future looks like in terms of these companies surviving or what chunks survive. Is it their most profitable? Is it them serving the wealthiest that can afford the services they provide? Great. Um, well, I, I wanna close um, by thanking our panelists uh, for the perspectives they bring, for the rich experience that they bring to this conversation. Um, this was really a whirlwind. This was a, a full year of my academic research that I think I shared in eight, eight or nine minutes. And um, and these are these are nuanced and complex topics that we're we're just only scratching the surface of. And so uh, you know, I do uh, uh, one of the great things about a Zoom conversation is that we can have people from all over. Um, one of the tough things is we can't have that hallway conversation afterwards. So. Um, Please, I think all of our, our names and information are out there. If you wanna continue this, please reach out. Um, and uh, otherwise, thank you so much for attending um, and uh, you know, to be continued. Thank you and, and Stephen, and, congratulations for the research. It's, it's yeah. a fantastic uh, contribution to the field. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs>